So in order to be successful, there needs to be cooperation from the students, the coaches, from the parents, and the program itself. Um, between the student and coach, coaches, there needs to be a mutuality and um, immediacy. They need, the, all, both of them need to be goal-oriented open to any new ch and open to any new challenges. The most important factor is the parents' readiness. They need to be informed. They need to be um, involved and supportive of their child. And the program needs to have resources, diversity. They need to integrate different factors and connect with different people and different uh, and other factors. And they need to be committed. And, and just one point here about skilled. Um, so we do work with the parents as well on certain tactics. Um, so it's a really daily process for everyone involved. Um, the parents literally would text us and say, okay, he's doing this right now. He's playing video games. What should I do? And sometimes we tell him, don't do anything. Or go just you know, tap on his back and say, oh, this looks like a nice game. Um, can I play with you? So it depends on, on the situation. But we do work with the parents to also give them the skills needed for the different uh, situations. So I just wanted to, to make that point. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So how does it work? Um, again, parent involvement is really, really important from the whole process. Uh, the very first point, like if there's interest, we would sit down with the parents, listen to their interests, their goals and objectives. And then we would bring in the student another time with the parents as well. And from that point on, the student starts to drive the process. Um, the parents be more, you know, on a consulting basis once a week, but it's the student that we work with every day. Um, we would validate their goals if they're realistic. We would work with them. Sometimes we know that it's not going to work. That's okay. We let them go through the experience and fail a couple of times um, because that helps them learn and gain some experience. Um, in that process, we teach them things, they implement it, and then you know we identify those challenges and they move on. So it's a very incremental process. Um, it's at the pace of the students. Some people move quicker than others. Sometimes there's setbacks. Um, that usually happens when there's long vacations, the family travels out of the country, things like that. Uh, or the student is sick for a prolonged period of time, we can't see them, you know, things of, of that nature. But usually, um, we stay in touch even if they're traveling over the internet and so forth. All right, so the overall bigger framework, uh, obviously it's based on the Quran and Sunnah, so we, we instill different values and concepts uh, throughout the process. For instance, today, this morning, I was talking to um, a young guy, 17, he just hasn't been to school for a while, and today he just decided not to go at all. So. Um, I was talking to him in the morning about different things in life and how he has to, you know, make the right decisions. And one of the things we, we talked about, I can't remember, but it was a couple of hadith that I brought up to him um, to kind of put this whole talk into perspective from, from this Islamic perspective. Uh, we do teach them project management skills as, as we move through. Um, so how to break down big tasks to smaller ones, you know, how to connect these tasks together, how to come up with a schedule, a plan, you know, milestones, that kind of stuff. We do Im embed in cognitive behavior therapy. It's been pretty popular the past 15 years or so as a new approach to, um, to help people basically take the lead and think you know, outside the box critically. The way we do it is um, either through discussions or we give them actual worksheets that are, again, custom developed pretty much for every student or every type of, of challenge. So we have one, for instance, for or some, a set of them for smoking marijuana, another set for pornography, a third set, and so forth. And again, they're very modular, so depending on the age and where they are with, with the issue or the challenge, we pick and choose them and so forth. But the whole purpose of that is to get them to think outside the box. And we would ask them questions like, um, is, is watching pornography um, in contradiction to the human nature? And you know, they might say, yeah, but no. And then we ask them a question a little bit later, it's like, is watching pornography haram? And they'd say, yeah. I was like, okay, so how could up front it be maybe, and now it's, it's clearly yes. So they get to connect the dots, and because we find that a lot of young people um, know what's haram and halal, but they can't connect that with, with the real world outside, because everyone else is doing it, or, or whatever it is. Um, we also use processes used in non-human systems, like engineering and so forth, to kind of help, again, the young person identify their needs, to verify that these needs are truly needs, they're not just wants and stuff like that. And then we integrate all this with like those six different learning methodologies or approaches we, we talked about as part of the overall ILIA framework. All right, any questions so far? Does a child have to be diagnosed with ADHD or if he, have, like, if he or she has 
some criteria or one criteria? No, they don't have to. So again, so far we've been talking about Empower One in general. Mm -hmm. We have students who are not ADHD. They're just, you know. Like, like difficult, something, yeah. as you mentioned before, like one who has some difficult issue in right. driving. Or, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Or it could be someone who doesn't even have a challenge. But they want to have a, a certain goal. Like a few years ago, we had um, a young brother who he wanted to marry a sister in the community. He was 16. That was his goal. And we helped him by 19. They got married and so forth. So it doesn't have to be like they have a problem, right? Um, but it could be anything, any goal that they want to achieve. Um, good question. So the approach, again, parents need to be ready for this. It's activity-based, very activity-based. So this is not like going to the doctor and telling your life story. Um, a lot of stuff we do outdoors. We take them to the mountains, um, go on trips, uh, they're home. Um, when we do daily stuff during school week, usually we meet them at home just so they don't waste too much time going back and forth, uh, unless they like live really, really far. Uh, but these are examples here of, of some of these worksheets. Um, as you can see, you know, different types of concepts that they learn. And I think that's, we covered the rest. Uh, we do a lot of stuff also with third party. One, one time, one year, we had a, a young guy who was in 10th grade do an internship with a technology company in Greenbelt over spring break for, for a week. That helped him just stay focused, and he was doing testing for uh, mobile handsets, and he was able to use that to verify his own personal goals as well. All right, so this is where some of our older folks ended up going, University of Maryland, you know, different colleges and places. Um, this young folk, uh, last year or year before, made this comment one day. Um, we find the ADHD kids are really, really fun to work with. They're so funny. They're a lot of energy. So this guy, was like, I was talking with him, and I was like, do you wanna, we were having a dinner, fundraiser dinner. I was like, did you wanna do a talk? And he's like, yeah, I'll do a rap. I was like, okay, cool, what are you gonna say? And he just came up with this, you know, Ilya won't kill ya. <laughs> so I was like, okay. All right, so um, am I doing this one? Okay. Uh, what is the successful profile? So the question that the sister asked. Um, anyone who's over tw tw 12 who's interested and committed. Those are the only three requirements, pretty much. It doesn't have to be someone who has problems. They don't have to be super smart uh, or a hard worker, or it's only for teenagers. We had actually an adult from overseas who was a pediatrician coming to the US. He got one of those US Dep uh, State Department visas, and he wanted um, a mentor to guide him how to start his life here. And, we worked him o with him over the internet, hooked him up with a pediatrician here. When he came, he worked at the MCC clinic. We got him set up there, and then he moved on. Uh, he brought his wife and, and uh, child. Uh, they don't have to be immature. I mean, not at all. And um, a lot of people feel that it's a very expensive program, uh, but that's, again, not the case. All right, so I'll let Aya take it from here. She'll talk to us a little bit about ADHD and the different uh, Ideas that are out there so in how our. Much does it cost? How much does we'll get to that. <laughs> so, what's ADHD? Scientifically, it's a neurological condition that emerges before the age of seven and can go into adolescence and adulthood. Um, symptoms include uh, uh, impulsivity, inattention, and hyperactivity, and they interfere with everyday functions. The exact causes are still unknown, however, scientists have found that there's a link between. Um, the size of the brain and the density as, uh, in the brain structures as well as the way different chemicals react in the brain. Scientists have discovered that um, children with ADHD have a smaller cortex, the region of the brain that controls uh, tension and thought, and the smaller size usually occurs near in the, front, in the frontal lobe, which is important for impulse control, socialization, reason, and judgment. Scientists have also found that, lower, there's, that there may be lower levels of dopamine in the brain, which is a chemical transmitter that carries information to and from nerve cells in the brain. Um, not having enough of this chemical can interfere with cognitive processes, processes that's associated with focus and attention. We see ADHD as a trait and not, rather than a disability. If, ma if it's managed properly, it can become a huge asset in one's life. When a doctor makes a diagnosis for ADHD, he, lo it, he looks at other factors that may contribute with the ADHD, such as uh, depression, low self-esteem, anxiety, substance abuse, or family turmoil. Great. And one thing to, to mention here, um, there's more than 10 theories about ADHD, what it is and what it's not. And they're theories. They're not even conclusive. Um, it's really interesting how they, um, in the 70s, had a different perspective than the 80s, the 90s, and 
very recently they started to look at it not even as a disorder, but more a behavioral issue uh, for various reasons. Some of it could be genetic, some could be like uh, Ayo saying, the brain is not developed enough yet, um, and that's why sometimes the symptoms you know, become weaker and weaker as the person um, grows. But regardless of the, the root cause, um, people feel there's a big group of people who nowadays feel that it's more behavioral and it could be you know, rectified without even medication. Um, and it's important for also the youth to understand this. Um, when we explain to them that, hey, your frontal lobe is where it's responsible for attention, and if that is not well connected to the rest of your brain, it's great you have all this knowledge in the rest of your brain, but the front of your brain can't access it. So now you're in a situation at school, um, you need to do some classwork, you're not paying attention that you need to do that. You know that classwork is important for you, but you can't do anything about it. And it takes you a number of, of you know, trials and efforts to be reminded about it and so forth. Um, so just that's our philosophy about it, that we've seen a lot of young people who can actually change certain behaviors through different ways of, of uh, working with them. Okay, so the challenges with ADHD is, um, <clears throat> Uh, these challenges like prevents children with ADHD from fulfilling their potential. They can have depression, anxiety. They might have trouble staying focused, being on task, getting organized, prioritizing, um, being on time, becoming easily frustrated, being impulsive, trouble with following through with any activity, um, and they have a tendency to underachieve, all while, un all while not understanding why it's happening to them. Uh, because of their inattention, they have poor concentra concentration, they're constantly daydreaming, they're disorganized and they're forgetful. Their impulsivity causes them to respond quickly without thinking through. They're sloppy, they're poor learners in a typical classroom setting, and they're like more likely to engage in risky behavior. Their hyperactivity causes them to be loud, noisy, squirmy, fidgety, um, overactive, and they're constantly wandering around. And all that hyperactivity is very like physically exerting since they have so much energy. Great. Any questions? So these challenges provide some risks. With inattention, children could lose their school work, they could perform poorly in school, waste any resources they might have, injure themselves, um, lose any opportunities that they might have, and have low self-esteem. Their impulsivity can cause them to damage, like, injure themselves, engage in fights. Um, they're more likely to engage in premarital sex, um, try out different drugs, and engage in different criminal activities. Their hyperactivity um, makes them socially unacceptable in society. They can become defiant, they're more likely to be bullied, um, and their ov the overactivity causes them to have sleep problems and diet problems. Yeah, and just a couple of points here. Um, a typical 14-year-old who smokes marijuana could eventually get off of it very easily. You know, his parents discipline him, this is bad for your health, and it stop. The problem with ADHD because of that dopamine issue that Maya mentioned, when they actually smoke it, it helps them. And its effect is very similar to Ritalin, the, the medication that they actually give the kids. So what happens is um, it makes them relax, that stress we were talking about earlier, and they actually start to smoke heavily um, and they become addicted to it. So that's why with ADHD youth, um, the, the risk of, of actually becoming addicted to drugs, cocaine or marijuana specifically, is, is really high. Um, even those uh, new vapes, those electronic cigarettes and so forth, the uh, same thing. With uh, premarital relationships, the same thing. Um, they're not attentive to that, this is wrong. We've seen a lot of young people got suspended from school at 6th, 7th, 8th grade just because they touched a girl inappropriately in the hallway or they talked to her in a certain way thinking that this is the way it is. Because again, they see things in the society and they think every, everything is like that, that's fine. Uh, because they're not paying attention that this is fake, this is virtual, this is a movie, this is you know, an advertisement, this is um, something on Google that is just out there. Uh, so they don't have a good connection of real life with what they see around them. Uh, you've seen kids who just, you know, they see someone that's really dear to them walk into the parking lot of the, the mansion with their car and they just jump on the car. You know, sixth grade, they just jump on the front, front hood of the car. Um, so stuff like that, and sometimes parents is like, why is my kid doing that? Um, it's really out of their control. But it could be rectified. I mean, talking them over and over, explaining to them, and explaining to them what's going on with them, that really helps right, as well.
Um, ADHD is kind of like a mixed bag. It's like a mixture of good and bad. Like there are opportunities with children who have ADHD. They're original. They're creative. They're energetic. They're big-hearted. They're interesting. They're engaging, and they're always thinking outside the box. Um, when they're talking, they always get to the point. They're high-level visionaries. They're very resource efficient. They're very humble, and they're very simple. Um, they also, because of their impulsivity, they're more likely to perform very well. Um, their mortar, mortar skills are very excellent, and they're very courageous. Uh, they're very outgoing and friendly. They're physical workers, so they don't get tired easily. Again, their motor, sk motor, motor skills are very high. They're athletic, and they love the outdoors. And, and when we say high performance tasks, uh, we're talking about tasks that are suitable for them. So for instance, they would be perfect air traffic controllers, people who can talk to 10 airplanes at the same time and, and not feel stressed out. Um, they're good with, like I was saying, motor skills, skills uh, or tasks that require a lot of physical effort and things like that. Um, but they'd be very poor with uh, skills that need writing, you know, or reading or that kind of thing. And they're also good with skills that don't require a lot of attention keep them like moving and thinking right. But when they find that uh, activity that they like, uh, we find them very focused in that particular activity. Yeah, usually kids with ADHD do very well in sports or drawing or anything creative. Right. All right, so I think we're almost um, at the end of this. So this is one success story we didn't want to, I mean, there's others in your handouts, I think, but we'll focus on that one. So this brother had, um, and the reason we, we picked this brother because he had a slew of, of challenges, really. Um, he used to go to Islamic school when he was young, from KG to about third, fourth grade. And then uh, while he was at school, um, he started inquiring about the world around him, and the school wasn't very able to respond appropriately. So he had a negative reaction to the school and Islam in general. So his parents had to put him out and take him to a public school. Um, unfortunately, being the inquisitive mind he is, he got exposed to pornography and smoking at a really young age, probably 10, 11. Um, and from there it just grew. Um, things just didn't work out. His parents are not knowing what's going on. He's not listening to us. He's very rebellious. You know, they start to lose hope into him. Um, and every year he gets suspended for a few times, you know, until he was like in seventh grade. He got suspended for two weeks um, for, you know, touching a girl in the hallway. And when I first sat down with him, I was like, what happened? He was like, I don't know. I just touched a girl. I don't know why they're making a big deal about it. Everyone does it at school. I was like, what do you mean everyone does it? Well, the whole problem was she didn't even complain. What, what happened is a friend, some other boy, He's the one who complained. He went to the principal and told them that this happened. But the girl, she didn't mind it, and we didn't do anything you know, wrong. I just tapped on her back. So he had no idea that this is inappropriate, Islamically, of course, and even it's against school policy. And whatever it is, um, the thing escalated. The police got involved. They suspended for two weeks. So he came to Ilya, and for two weeks, he basically was, was being coached by us. Uh, we set him up with a pretty outdoor activity for those two weeks fishing, hiking, biking, all kinds of stuff like that. He was into a lot of things that the young people are games and choose and what have you. So we had him uh, start thinking about his his career. You know, what do you want to do in your life? And, you know, he said, I want to sell shoes. All right, how are you going to do that? So in those two weeks, we helped him figure out what his purpose in life was. That was the main goal. And to help him prep him to go back to school, to be able to deal, deal with his peers uh, who's gonna, who are going to make fun of him with his principal, who's going to obviously have a conference with him and his parents and grill him to death, and his teachers, who had enough of him for the past year. So um, after that, it worked well. He In the meeting, we were with him in the meeting, in the conference with his parents and, and principal. Um, at first, he was very shaky. He didn't know how to respond. They said, what do you do in those two weeks? He couldn't talk. Um, we took him out of the room, sat down with him. Just tell him what you did in two weeks. Tell him you went fishing. Tell him you did this and that. Um, so he was more comfortable, he went in and told him that, um, and he got back to school. Alhamdulillah, since then, that has been about two or three years now, he has not been suspended uh, again from school, uh, Alhamdulillah. His smoking also has been drastically uh, cut, uh, actually it stopped for a pretty good period of time, about a year or so, um, and uh, he maybe smoked a couple of times, but the good thing is he would let us know. So he would 
Um, again, something we work with our students on is, is trust and openness. Uh, we don't expect you to be angels. Change does take time for any human being. But we expect you when you do something that is not inconsistent with your goals, you raise your hand and you write it down and you see what happened. Um, so that was good. Um, he would you know, reach out to us, he would text, you know, in the middle of the night, hey, I can't sleep, I, I really need to go out. And, you know, sometimes we work with the parents, hey, your kid is not feeling well, just go check on him. Sometimes, you know, we take care of it ourselves. Um, so his goals was to stop smoking, to learn the etiquettes of how to deal with a female uh, peer at school. Uh, so he learned a little bit about that. He also got to have a better mindset of what a female is. So she's not just a piece of flesh, but she's a human being, and she has a role in society and so forth. And you know, if you're interested in someone, there's a process in STEM to talk about it with their parents and so forth. Uh, and then he wanted to stay in school. He, you know, did not love school, but he wanted to be in school because obviously his friends are there and so forth. So what he was able to achieve, I think the biggest thing was really his self-esteem. I can never forget that night he texted me one day. He said it was not 11:30 p.m. and he said. I don't feel I'm worthless anymore. I mean, this was like to me, <laughs> the world. Um, and that was his problem because he's been in these types of situations for the past three years since fourth grade. He just felt he's like he's nothing. And, you know, he had no hope. He was just lost. And, uh, you know, he texted me that thing. And I was like, wow, this is, this is great. So he became more aware how to handle stress. Uh, one way is like if I'm stressed out rather than go smoke, uh, I will call an adult. I'll let my coach know. Uh, he started to build trust. He could now trust adults. He is more trusting of his parents. His parents are more able to deal with him and understand his situation and so forth. His school grades really, really improved. Um, around that same time, he said, I feel much better. Uh, I have more self-esteem. From E's to like A's and B's. And then, unfortunately, there was a, a death in the family and they started to drop again for, for a while. But alhamdulillah, he made it out of the, the, the school in the grade. So that was a quick uh, case study. What did we do with this young guy? Um, obviously coaching some counseling. Um, there was a little bit of element of tutoring. We had a couple of tutors work with him on different subjects, you know, off and on, uh, just to get his academics up for a few weeks. And then we gave him a couple of internships over the span of, of a year, a year and a half. Um, and that helped him with different skill sets socially, you know, career-wise and so forth. Any questions on this particular case or similar cases? All right. All right, so the sister asked earlier how much does it cost? Um, it depends. So we, we go by an hourly rate, but usually with this version of Empower One, which is what we call Wazir, which we really recommend for the ADHD students, it's because it's a daily program. Students get between five to sometimes 20 hours a week, depending on what's happening. Um, it's about 990 uh, a month. Um, obviously, that's very, very low compared to like a medical doctor bill, you know, $250 an hour. I remember that, that brother we're talking about, his, um, his parent wanted to take him to a psychiatric. And insurance usually doesn't cover that. So I said, oh, they're so expensive, it's $250 an hour. I was like, yeah, but you need to take him there. He's like, ah, oh, he's just misbehaving. He knows right and wrong, he just needs to straighten up. <laughs> I was like, okay, why don't you let the doctor tell you that? And um, it took that his father a year to be convinced that he needs to go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. By the time he was in like 10th grade. Um, and then they said, okay, we're taking you to the doctor. Because now they start to see things that are very inappropriate with him and stuff like that. So he said, no, I'm not going to the doctor. I want to go to Ilya. So his mom called us and we said, okay, no problem, we'll work with him. <laughs> but, but you guys have to realize that he's not faking this. He does have challenges, he can get over them, but until you realize and admit it and acknowledge it to him, he's never gonna change. So they started to be more accepting of that fact that yes, some of or most of this is out of his control and he truly wants to, to change. So um, the way it works is that, um, again, we sit down with the parents understand their goals, what they're trying to achieve. Uh, if they're reasonable, if it's within the context of what we can provide, we would go to the next step and then sit down with the youth and then work out a plan from, from there. So there's a lot of good literature out there. Uh, for parents, there's a bunch of uh, resources here. This book is a really interesting one. I would recommend you try to grab it from the library or get it online. Um, 
it's, it's about 10, 15 years old, but it does talk about the different um, phases of dealing with ADHD since the 80s, how people have um, mis, you know, diagnosed it or mis, uh, dealt with it in the past and how people are starting to deal with it in a different um, context today. For the young people, there's also a few books that are uh, interesting. There's one called uh, Putting on the Brakes and You're Not Your Brain. Um, those are also good references for the young people to read and you know, get educated. All right. Um, I think that kind of concludes it. Yep. There are a few more other case studies in the back here, um, but they kind of, that one covers sort of the whole, you know, landscape. So there's some cards if you had questions, you know, you can uh, fill them out. Uh, Can or, we just ask? Oh, of course, yeah. <laughs> I and mean, sometimes people don't feel comfortable. But. So the um, the three and a half to five hours on average, would that be over the week, like five days, like maybe yeah. an hour a day, or? Exactly, so um, there's no set schedule because people's lives are different. Um, sometimes it's an hour a day for a week, and then maybe the following week, half an hour a day, and then maybe we give the young person a couple of days off uh, and then we do like a big three hour. For instance, um, last week with one student, he said, no, I can't see you today, it's Thursday. Um, he just wasn't in the mood. I said, fine. He said, but tomorrow, Friday, I can sit down in for three hours. I was like, okay, <laughs> works. But I still did see him Thursday. So I said, not a, not a problem. Uh, I'll just swing by for 15 minutes. And he's like, okay. And then he actually called me and said, uh, you're still coming? I said, yeah. I said, okay, can we go get some ice cream? I'm like, yeah, no problem. So there's always ways to, to keep uh, the pace. Uh, we adjust it depending on their goals and their motivation level. So we want to make sure they're like an airplane taking off. If they're reaching that cruise point, we would let go a little bit. Uh, because also, we don't want to put any pressure on them. Um, so it's very carefully managed. Um, like that young gentleman today I was telling you about who didn't go to school. I mean, this is like maybe his second week. And the first week, his mother was very nervous. And you know, I told her certain things we need to do, and she was a little resistant. Um, I said, "Okay, let's wait another week." And obviously, things just turned south. Uh, so today, I met him for a good four hours or so, and um, I said, "What do you want to do? Go to school?" It was about one o'clock, and we still had an hour. He said, "No, I don't think so." I said, "Okay, no problem." Um, but I'm worried about tomorrow. I said, "Well, you need to give up your video games." He's addicted to video games, so his problem is that's video game addiction. I, I was like. You can put your computer in my trunk. I'll bring it to you tomorrow. It's not going to go anywhere. Um, but he couldn't take that stuff. I said, if you're worried about tomorrow, um, it's because of your computer. If you give it to me, I don't think you'll be worried. You know you can get up and go to school. So um, that's how we set it up. In some weeks, it could be as many as 13, 14, 15 hours. Um, last week, I took one guy out for 10 hours um, because he needed it. Uh, then I didn't see him for two, three days. So it depends. So it is one to one uh, coaching. It's one to one, yeah. And yeah. how many coaches do you have on staff? We have two. So myself and there's another gentleman, um, and each person takes about six or so at the most. Do you five have six. female clients? We had one in the past. Okay. Um, one. Yeah, okay. we had one sister. She was 17. Um, she was on one of our programs classes, and she took a lot of pills that day. And then we worked with her for a couple of months after that, um, but she, she became fine. She was uh, 18 at the time, I think. And so then, what's the average, just the average length of time from like takeoff to cruise? That really depends mm -hmm. on people. It's very different. Um, with one brother, it took about six months. Um, that was a 17-year-old from a different state. He had to move here with one of his relatives. Um, he had drinking problems and smoking, and they tried to put him in a slamming school, it didn't work. So he got depressed, he hated his mother, he stopped talking to her. Um, it just, he, he was an atheist, he lost his slam completely at 12, but it took him about six months. Um, someone else, maybe four weeks. It really depends on what they're trying to. And after that intensive work, is there some kind of follow-up 
connection that is. Yeah, if the student wants to continue, sure. Uh, the frequency would typically be less, so maybe once a month we touch base. Um, that gentleman I was talking to about um, the driving uh, issue, we touch base every like six months or so. Very informal. I mean, he's graduated now, he works at a technology company, he's like in his mid 20s. Um, but he still drops by, he's like, hey, I'm doing this, what do you think? I'm um, working on my master's, what do you think? That kind of stuff. So we do stay connected if, if the student is interested. We have one uh, person overseas, um, he's in college, and we communicate over Google Hangouts um, again. Um, so this is for the coaching, right? If there's tutoring, that's additional? Yeah, tutoring is different. So. I mean, if we just go over skim stuff, it would probably be included. So sometimes when we're meeting with them, like, what do you got in your back? Oh, my math homework. All right, let's take a look at it. And, you know, maybe we do a little 10 minute tutoring session. Um, that's kind of included. But if, like, a person is in ninth grade and they're at seventh grade math level, then we would probably get a tutor and say, all right, you're going to work with this person for the next three, four weeks to get you up to speed. And then we would stop it there and they just. Uh, so when it comes to academics, we're more just coaching them how to study, how to check your stuff. Okay, this is what you need to tell your teacher. Uh, you can copy us in the email if you want. If you don't, that's fine. But let us know what she or he told you. So we work with them kind of to guide them. Um, if they're academically weak, then we would recommend a tutoring program. And like you said, that would be a little extra. I think on one of the slides I saw a reference to homeschooling. Mm -hmm. Yes, so we are thinking in the fall, inshallah, to start a homeschooling program only for ADHD boys. Um, we'll limit it to six uh, people per grade, probably grades six through 10 or 11. Um, it's a very different program. Um, so this program is, is coaching. That other one is like a schooling program. Um, it's, it's based on heavily experiential learning. They don't have subjects like math, science, English. Um, yeah, you might have a copy of What it is is um, it's applications. So for instance, today's or this week's class is on watersheds and water reservation. And in that topic, they learn about, and this is like under the creation of the law. So the class is called creation of the law one for sixth grade. And this week's topic is water, conservation, and so forth. And we talk about math concepts, so volume and flow. They learn a little bit of physics. They learn a little bit of uh, science. They go on field trips to the bay. You know, so it's a lot of outdoor stuff. It's a full day program from like nine to six. There's no homework at all. Everything's done at the school. And um, they spend like three hours of the day in the morning at the school to learn some basic stuff. And then the rest of the day, they're out doing something. Um, they might even travel multi nights uh, to some other city to do some projects and stuff like that. Um, and then there's also Quran component heads uh, towards the end of the day. So the last you know, hour and a half or two hours, they get to, to memorize Quran. Um, so the objective or the, the way we would operate this program is pretty much a very hands-on um, approach. Um, it's not like a typical classroom where you sit and you, know, you read your science book or okay, answer these 20 math problems or questions. We would give them those questions in the form of, of uh, exercise. What we did, and we do some of that with the coaching, but not necessarily in a holistic schooling approach. For instance, last year we had an eighth grader who uh, was really weak in math, and he loved shoes. So we got a Nike shoe put in front of us and said, OK, let's look at the swoosh. And from there, let's practice some angles. It was an angles class, you know, this and that and so forth. And we drew the shoe where it's all lines and so forth, and you know that's how they learn things. <laughs> so it would be stuff similar to that. Yeah, that kind of approach is, is good for everyone. Not just of course, the absolutely. Kids, so. But the thing is, those that particular group needs it more. But yeah, of course, you're absolutely right. And you know, the education system has not changed in the past 150 years, and did not catch up to the rest of the world. So um, yeah, I mean, even. All kids go to school, they don't really love it anymore. So where would that schooling program take place? So the current facility in Baltimore, in Gwyn Oak, okay. that's where like, they come every day. And then you know, they go from there to different places. And this is a for sure thing, or is this just a thought? We're working pretty aggressively on it. We start talking to the state, and 
look at the requirements. There would be a, a diploma at the end of that. Yeah, so same as, as a homeschool program. Uh, we're still we're still not quite sure if it's going to be like a homeschool umbrella where you register with your local uh, county and then you get from there. there you know, you can check it off and stuff. Uh, or it would be a non-public school. In that case, they get the diploma. Um, we just need to check on some of the requirements. Um, the non-public school might have a benefit to parents where they might be able to pay off some of the fees through uh, medical expenses or through state grants. Um, but I don't know, that might be a longer process. So, you know, we'll, we'll try to work it out. We work it all with um, Jose Acevedo, who's working toward um, bringing Andalus back online. Maybe a good okay. combination. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't aware of that. I know they have Rehla, uh, homeschool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. he's, he's mm -hmm. going to pull that. Yeah. Yeah. So. But yeah. still, we're lacking uh, any program for girls. I know ADHD is more, you know, more common than boys, but I mean, if a girl has certain difficulty, not, cert not necessarily ADHD. So not not schooling, but coaching, yeah, we can work with yeah. the system. Mm -hmm. yeah. We also have um, a good network of psychologists and Muslim psychiatrists and psychologists, sisters and brothers, mm -hmm. that we always refer to. Um, we also have a couple of non-Muslims who really understand our culture well. Uh, they've seen some of our youth for free. Um, a couple of them are retired, and they don't charge. Like they can't charge, but they also are just nice. And, um, like that sister who had some suicidal issues, we recommended that she go see him. He said she's fine. And come to that, you know, we coached her for about uh, four months, and you know she moved on. Any questions for Aya? <laughs> Did you miss anything at the beginning? I don't no, I don't think so. I caught up. Okay. Type. So, um, there is here a little survey uh, for that school idea. If um, you'd like to jot it off. Do you know what the um, fees for that might be? Not yet. Um, you know, they're typically um, in the 20s and 30s, but I don't think it would be that high. Um, but again, it depends on what we're trying to do. We have um, a couple of grants out there for some resources. If we can get those, that would help, um, definitely. Because of the nature of the program, we're gonna need uh, transportation, um, a couple of vans or a van, and uh, that would be a key uh, constraint. Well, we still have about half an hour, so if anyone has questions, you can use these cards. Is everyone's uh, child here in middle school? I know there was a 10th grader. Is everyone else like younger? Okay. Yeah. No, I mean, no. It's, it's important just to take your pace. You know, don't stress, don't stress it out. It's really important that both parents be on the same page, uh, especially the father if it's a boy, because at that age, 14, uh, the boys really are looking for the acceptance of the father. And it's just filtra that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us rebellious at that age and they start to compete with their dads at home. And if the father is just not accepting that I mean, I've seen so many times I'll be sitting with the, the family and the dad just utters something which, you know, might be okay, but you just, the kid just walks up and goes to his room. And everything we've done in the past week or two is just gone. <laughs> we gotta start from square zero. And you sit down with the boy and like, no, I, I, he just doesn't get it. I had one kid just this week say, um, no, I'm not going to sit with you and him. Because, I'm like, why? And he's like, because he's going to say something, I won't control myself, and then I'll have to respond. So uh, it's really important, before even we start any of this, that the two parents, especially the fathers, are, are in sync and understanding. But there's some snacks in the child like? I'm the principal of the MCC Sunday School, and we've got okay. about 300 kids coming through um, Sunday School you know, once a week, and we see such a wide range of behaviors. I don't know if um, if any of those families would dedicate the kind of time and attention and money to these kinds of issues that you're talking, but I think that 
a lot of kids could use this kind of supplemental support in some manner. So is there anything, I know you have programs all, all the time. We have a, a Empower One group type of coaching. So it's a group setting. Um, usually it's about maximum five kids together. Um, we usually group them similar background and interest and so forth. Uh, it's not daily, it's usually weekly. And it's usually lumped into another program of Ilya. So like uh, uh, an internship or a service learning like Green Sprouts, for instance, the gardening thing. So those five kids would come together. And through the activity, we kind of coach them on something. Um, it helps, but if there are problems or challenges that are severe like this, where they could harm themselves or other or lose their team, we can't really do too yeah, much. I think there's, it's less than that. It's, it's the fact that they live in a society that's plugged in, that plugged in nature is changing the way their brains work, it's right. changing their attention spans, it's affecting how, you right. know, what they're attracted to, um, what they're, right. um, and so those, you know, those, those are things that are right. affecting all of our kids. The most important thing there are the parents. I mean, I cannot overemphasize how many kids I've seen go wasted because of their parents. The parent would not want to drive them Friday night to our center. I mean, the kids would be begging me to pick them up. And I used to, but I cannot pick up 20 kids. And they say, okay, come take us off from the Columbia Mall. And you go, there's like eight, and your car takes six. You know? So I was like, okay, can we talk to your parents? And I don't know, he will yell at me if you call him. I was like, no, no, don't worry. Is he home? Yeah, he's home. All right, uh, I'll talk to him. And there were a few cases where the parent would come, and I could tell he was not happy, you know. And probably the kid had some rough time when he got home. But regardless what this MCC or the center of the school or Ilya does, if the parent is not appreciative of that fact you just mentioned, the society and all this, and that their kids need this stuff, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. You will end up with frustrated kids. I know at least a dozen who, um, there's 17, 18, 9, now 19, 18, 17, and they're frustrated. Uh, you can tell from what they post on the internet, uh, the language, the way they approach their peers. Um, you talk to them, it's like, hey, how's it going? It's like, just worry about yourself. You know? And that same kid, when he was 14, he was that kid that would say, can you take me to the masjid? Can you come after school, pick me up for Joma? You know, but because he did not get the support infrastructure that we were talking about earlier, he got frustrated. And now to elevate his frustration, he just goes with the flow, whatever makes him feel comfortable and, and able to survive. So parents are extremely important. One thing we could do with, with the masjid, uh, besides a program for the youth, is a program for the adults. Yes. And, you know, adults are very sensitive. Uh, you want to be politically sensitive, so you can't call it like parent coaching, right? Um, but maybe like. Thank you. <laughs> um, a lot of parents won't come. It's like, I don't need this. You know, you got to coach me. I mean, some of the parents, I can't tell them when we say, we call it parent readiness. We don't call it parent training or coaching because they're like, oh, so I'm the problem. You're telling me I'm the problem. I do all of this stuff for him. I get him to soccer, I take him to the masjid, and he's still not acting properly. So we have to be very sensitive and careful with, with you know, this is the way it is with our community. Um, but we did something with ICCL, for instance, um, on internet usage. Yeah. So we educated the parents about what the opportunities are. If you want your son or daughter to use the internet properly, it's not enough to tell them the bad stuff about it. Before you tell them bad stuff, you need to tell them the good stuff. So when we did the workshop at ICCL, the first half was about opportunities of the internet. We talked, we actually, maybe half an hour was just how the internet works. All the packets, how they move in the routers, and all the excitement of the technology, and then we told them, okay, these are the opportunities, and at the very end, we told them, okay, these are the risks, and we had a police officer come in and give it some more, you know, official weight. Um, so the kids are not taking, like, okay, this is another lecture. Um, there's some exciting stuff in it. So I think we need to work with parents to kind of get that mindset, uh, and, and that's the best you can hope for. If they become involved, then a lot of this stuff will just automatically disappear. Can you tell us a little bit more about these um, leadership clubs? I know they're not specifically about ADHD, but mm -hmm. how... Sure, so those are, are subject matter uh, focused areas that people would be interested in. For instance, robotics for people who like STEM. 
we have one on cybersecurity, and there's one on gardening. Um, there's one for social skills called Halalia. Um, the youth, they just come hang out with each other, have pizza, and it's sort of similar to uh, like a Masjid Halafa type of thing. Uh, but more social, they sometimes go off site, you know, different places and so forth. And we try to mix the group with real society. So it's not just sitting inside the, the center and taking a class or a lecture, but we go outside, like, you know, we go buy stuff from Home Depot, and while they're standing in line, they're pushing each other. It's like, okay, guys, that's not appropriate, you know. Um, in this society, you don't do that. Yeah, stuff like that. Uh, so usually it's for people who don't want to come to a classroom. They might not be interested in coaching, but they like you know, robotics and programming. So they come to this class, and in the robotics class, I mean, they learn robotics, that goes in, what have you. But the focus is on, like, planning, teamwork, how to work together in groups of three or four, uh, competition. You know, so the, the focus is on, like, four leadership traits that, that we were talking about earlier, uh, those certifications. They learn those four traits over, like, six weeks in a robotics set. Uh, with cybersecurity, we focus on privacy, confidentiality, integrity. So those are three traits that they learn um, as a data network and then as a human being, you know, as a leader, I need to have those three traits. So that's how we kind of uh, use those clubs. Unfortunately, they're not all very active right now because it's hard to find volunteers and teachers. Um, but they go on and off. Like, the robotics was really active in 2012 and 13. Green Sprouts right now is, is really active in uh, Canada. It's in Green Oak. Yeah, it starts March, April until October. And we have all ages in that, um, as young as seven up to, we have a brother 70 some years who teaches the, the youth. Um, and we have high schoolers, they kind of coach the younger ones, some college age people come in. So that's a good one. Do you have counseling listed on here? Like family and teenagers, who does the right. counseling? So I do a lot of that as well. Um, we've done a few family counseling, like divorce cases and stuff like that, but it's mostly family with their children um, type of counseling. So we haven't had a lot of requests for, for marriage counseling, but we do have uh, a bunch of requests from parents how to deal with their young people, how to communicate with them effectively, how to get them to stop using bad language and things like that. But the counseling is more like coaching. Right, so like we don't prescribe medication or anything like that, um, but we've dealt with cases like Asperger's, um, chronic lying, um, we had un, um, what they call unwanted same gender attraction, um, that was one case in a guy 12 years old. So we deal with the same concepts, but it's again in an applied environment, you know, um, so it's not like going to the doctor, because it's really hard to take a 14 year old to psychiatric. They're usually not going to agree. And if they do, um, it's not very effective. They'll go for a couple of times. And, um, most of the people we also work with, um, they stop taking their medication, which actually we like, we prefer. We don't tell people to stop medicine. Uh, that's between them and their physician. Um, but I have kids who's like, I, I don't want to take my medicine. It upsets my stomach. I can't sleep at night. It just makes me upset and I feel like I'm a piece of rock. Um, and we don't push back. If the kid says, I don't want it, and the parents, okay, you, you let it go. Uh, we prefer that because then they could be really coached well. Uh, they're not dependent on some chemical and so forth. Uh, there are cases that they have to take, like there's one guy who has Asperger, and he, he has to take his medicine. Um, although, when we, last year, I think, we, we recommended that he cuts the dosage because we felt he's actually pretty highly functioning. I mean, he, he's goes out in society, he had a lot of friends from the community, but then they changed the doctor, they gave him a different medication, and he just changed completely, he became very isolated, very uh, confined, and that's when he started developing that video game addiction, and now he can't get off of it, and we told the parents, you got to get that computer out of the house, and they're resistant, it's like, no, we're worried that he won't go to school, he would mm -hmm. kind of get a setback, and get depressed and not go to school. I'm like, you have to choose your, you know, you can't put the thing in front of him and then expect that. Okay, can you get him to go to drama? He's like, no, that's the most important time of the week because that's the last day of the week when he gets his tutorial, working with all the teachers. And I was like, you're really not helping. You know, he really needs to go to the masjid. He needs to pray. And he needs to get off of the computer. And then we can worry about other things later. So sometimes, you know, parents follow what the doctor recommends. Um, that second physician, said, we'll change the medication, get very low dosage, we're not going to force anything on him, 
and we need to let him do some gaming because that gets his stress out. Uh, that was a different opinion than his first doctor, who said, "No, you got to take the computer, you know, by force or by good way. Doesn't matter. Um, and you know, this is how it is." So they didn't like that. They went to the other doctor. Um, but at the end, we kind of respect what the parent does with the doctor because they're the medical professional. I mean, they know better. Um, but we would work with the, the student regardless. They take or don't take. Does anyone have daughters here interested in this? I have a daughter that she lives overseas. <laughs> <laughs> one too old, one too young. <laughs> Frustrations is um, my so like Adam's siblings' inability to understand what ADHD is. So they perceive him as you know a problem or oh my god here he goes again. He's yeah, the one who's so. gonna mess up our plans. And so then when you actually look for material, you know um, videos, some you know um, educational opportunity for the kids to to learn, you know right. the. Um, you know, the physiological processes that are in place, there's nothing really out there. Um, and I think that contributes a lot to, you know, the child's sense of where they belong or don't belong within the family structure, and whether that's a right. positive presence or a negative presence. Right. So. Absolutely. I mean, that's the socially unacceptable thing there, is that the siblings and the peers would start mm -hmm. to reject that person. Mm -hmm. Not only that, they'll get bullied. Mm -hmm. And you would see that when they start to bully their siblings or other people. Yeah. Um, and, and it's heartbreaking. You see the kid in the masjid with six other boys, and then they start calling him names, or, hey, you're immature. That's why people don't like you, because you do silly stuff. So you know what's a very interesting thing that I have found? And if you want to do anything to assist, here's what I would recommend. Um, there's a large number of brothers. Some of them are foreign-born, and some of them are not, who have no understanding of child development at all. Um, and so they encounter a child like this, and they think there's something wrong with the child. And the child doesn't understand.